There appears to be open warfare within the Conservative Party, with MPs at every level discussing whether the PM should quit. Liz Truss is only weeks into the job. It's hard to keep up. And how does that all feed into the live debate here in Scotland about independence, currently being discussed at the UK's highest court? Tonight, we are in the Scottish east coast town of Musselburgh, once a traditional fishing community, now most famous for its golf and its race course. And it's only five miles from the Scottish Parliament. We'll also be talking about, what well, about how we should be talking. Scotland's first minister said she detests the Tories. Has politics got too nasty? Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, one of the most senior figures in the Scottish independence movement, John Swinney, a former leader of the SNP. He's now Deputy First Minister, looking after the Scottish Government's economy brief as well. For two years, Douglas Ross has led the Scottish Conservatives, Holyrood's second biggest party. In January, he called for the resignation of Boris Johnson, reversed it two months later, and then voted against him in this summer's confidence vote. Mr Ross is also an elite level football assistant referee. Leading Scottish Labour is Anna Sawa. The Glaswegian was a dentist until entering political life in 2010. Last year, he became Scottish Labour's fifth leader in 10 years. The journalist and broadcaster Isabel Hardman is assistant editor of The Spectator magazine, presents a politics programme for Times Radio, and has written a book called Why We Get the Wrong Politicians. And Stuart Murdoch is the lead singer of the much-loved group Bell and Sebastian, once voted Scotland's greatest ever band by List magazine. Stuart is a supporter of Scottish independence. Good evening. Welcome to my panel. Welcome to the audience here in Musselburgh. Good to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home as well. Do join in the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time. Take part in the debate. Let's hear what you've got to say. And we'll kick off with our first question, which is from David Douglas. Can Liz Trust unite our backbenchers and in turn calm the market, or has it gone too far already? Well, as I said at the beginning, it's hard to keep up, Douglas. It is. Um, look, this has not been the start Liz Truss was looking for. The growth plan uh, was designed to stimulate the economy and it hasn't gone as planned. Uh, I think it's right that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have reflected on that. Uh, one of the big issues that clearly there wasn't the support in the markets and we saw the, uh, the impact that had was on the 45p tax rate and I think it was right last week uh, that that was reversed. But I think it's also right that we look at the positive impacts of the uh, growth plan which was to help people with heating bills. Before that was announced, people were facing bills of five to six thousand pounds a year. It's now capped at two and a half thousand. I know that's still very high, too much for a lot of people, but it's, uh, you know, the help that the government have put in there is important to families, to businesses, to communities right across Scotland and the whole UK, and I do think that is vital. It's extraordinarily febrile isn't it, at Westminster at the moment, when it comes to the Conservative Party. You were the first MP to publicly say that Boris Johnson should go. Do you want to go for the double tonight? No, I don't. And say that Liz Truss should go? No, I go? don't. No, I, I don't. Look, Liz Truss has been Prime Minister uh, for a month. Uh, look at what's I changed. Think it's six weeks. Is it six yes. weeks? Uh, uh, well, six weeks, and a lot has happened in that time. As I say, we've had that massive intervention. But you think to help she should people. stay in the job? Yes, yes, I do, and I think. So she has your full back. Yes, um, you know, I spoke to, to the prime minister on Tuesday. I spoke to the chancellor uh, this week as well. Uh, as I say, it has not gone uh, as she and the chancellor had hoped. The interventions were to help grow the economy, but crucially to help people with bills this winter and next winter, because that is going to be a crucial period where people are seeing their bills going up to levels that were unaffordable for many. It's still very high, I understand okay, that, but we had, to, that point, we had to you. help. John? I think the, the bit in what Douglas has said that I agree with is that the energy assistance package has been welcomed because people are living in terror about the rise in energy costs. But as a consequence of the mini budget, people are also living in terror about more, about mortgage costs going up, which are a direct consequence of the folly of the mini-budget. And people will now lose their homes because of rises in mortgage rates because of the mismanagement of that mini-budget and its economic consequences. So, you know, I'm reading as I came here tonight news that's seeping out of Downing Street, which is saying that the 
mini budget is going to be unpicked, if not entirely reversed. That is of colossal damage to people. The, the whole process is of colossal damage. I hope the mini budget is unpicked because it is fiscally unsustainable. And the Conservative Party have put the economic prospects of every citizen of our country in jeopardy because of the economic folly they presided over a couple of weeks ago. And you can get around the rest of you and come to the audience. But Douglas, do you just want to comment on that? Because I, I, I too am seeing reports that there's going to be a, a U-turn coming, possibly, the, possibly tomorrow, possibly within the next week. You obviously are a very senior Conservative. What can you tell us about that? Well, the, the Chancellor has made it clear in Washington that the growth plan is... Uh, well, he's, made plan, it, he's sticking to it. He's sticking to it. But that we're plan. hearing there could be a U-turn yes, coming. And, what can you and, tell him? Well, I can only tell you what the Chancellor has said in the interviews okay. in Washington. I haven't spoken to him today. But clearly, there is the need to grow the economy. There is the need uh, to help businesses, to help individuals. And that's what the Chancellor, the Prime Minister and the government are would, determined to do. Would you welcome a U-turn? Well, I, I think, you know, we can't see it going up to 25%, as was planned in, in April but, next, but, next year. Well, hold on, John, if I can. Because that is to help businesses. You know, if we are going into really difficult times, we want to make it okay, so easier for businesses to employ people, to, to produce and to, to build. And that's what's important going forward. John, if I can, because it really is important that we get the economy going again, because we are seeing this is an issue that is affecting everyone in this audience, everyone across the country. Is there anything but you'd also, like to see you turn on at this point? I was just going to say, Fiona, but we're also seeing this in other countries across the world. We're seeing inflation is going... We're seeing inflation at higher levels than in, than in the United Kingdom, in the, the United Douglas, States, Douglas, in Australia, Douglas, in Canada. Douglas, if, if you look at all of the economic analysis, it demonstrates the UK's position is worse because of the mini-budget. That is the reality of what's the situation we face. And you, Douglas, you were out of the traps right away demanding that I repeat exactly the mistakes well, that the UK government has made. And the UK <laughs> government is about to... Briefly, because then I want to hear from the audience. Well, at the moment, if John does nothing as Scotland's economic uh, secretary, at, people, people, mess, people earning as little as £15,000 a, a year okay. will be more budget. in tax can, than the rest of the United Kingdom. I can see the Surely peace, you can help the low Peace and love has Scotland. already broken out on the Crescent Time panel. Let's take a moment and let's hear from our audience here. So, yes, uh, the woman at the back with the glasses with a sort of beige top, I can't quite see. There you are. Um, Douglas Ross was saying that the... Um, the he, Government had given the help towards the heating bills. Everything else has gone up. Everything else. People can't afford food, can't afford to put their heating on, so they don't know that it's gone up. Clothing's gone up, housing's gone up, everything's gone up, and there's no help for anything like that. OK. The woman here at the front, in the brown. Um, Douglas says that um, Liz Truss has got off to a bad start. I mean, that's clearly a massive understatement, and it's completely self-inflicted. Um, I think it shows a really worrying lack of judgment that senior figures in the Treasury were fired, um, that the OBR wasn't consulted, and we were on a mini-budget that has completely crashed the economy pretty much, and we're worried about the future of our pension funds. So to say that, you know, we've got off to a bad start is madness. You know, I just, I just think we need a general election as soon as Absolutely. possible. Man here in the great up. You said that the, the price cap on energy is £2,500, but that's not, it's not technically a price cap as it's based on average household usage. So I, I live by myself, one person flat, I'm going to use less energy than a household of four or five families who, are, who might be in a worse condition, uh, than, uh, worse state than I am. So to say it's a price cap is, is just wrong. Uh, and to go back to uh, John Swinney's point about after this mini budget, we've now got rising interest rate, rising food prices, so you're, you've not really helped in any way. The, the Blizz Trust hasn't helped, they've given us this, this price cap, but then all my money that I'm going to save is now going to be used on food, on uh, other means, paying back my mortgage, stuff like that. So it's cancelled each other out, it's not helped in any way. Isabel, um, I'm interested in you. I mean, you wrote a book, Why We Get the Wrong Politicians, I'm not in any sense suggesting that's what we've got here. I'm not making a judgment on that at all. But the question it's not is, gone out of date, though. Can, can, can Liz Truss unite her backbenchers and in turn calm the market, or is it, or is it all just gone too far now? I think it's very hard to see how she can do either or both of those things. Uh, I think she has framed herself as somebody who takes decisions without thinking them through and then uh, reverses them. I, 
appreciate what Douglas says about the, the sort of the world dynamics, but there's not a, a global pandemic of U-turns, is there? I think this, this is a, a specific problem to the Trust administration, um, that she has lost the confidence of her backbenchers. I, I cannot tell you how many MPs, uh, Douglas's colleagues, who are getting in touch with me um, with long lists, I mean, longer than my weekly shopping list, of things that she needs to change about her operation to have a chance of surviving to the next election. But what they price into those shopping lists is that they're going to lose the next election. And to me, the Conservative Party really over the past, even in the sort of, you know, the final months of Boris Johnson, it's felt like a party that is longing for a spell in the sort of political equivalent of rehab, that it wants to go into opposition, that, you know, MPs were saying this to me openly at the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham, that they need a break, they're exhausted, they've run out of ideas. And so it's not just actually all is Truss's fault. It's actually a symptom of where the party is more widely, that it has become uh, less governable. I'm not saying necessarily fully ungovernable, but uh, it's also running out of uh, people with the ideas to lead it and to work out what the Conservatives should stand for today. Anna. The, the reality is Liz Truss is finished. Quasi Quarteng is finished. And I hope the people have woken up across this country and it means the Conservative Party is finished as well. Because they have exposed, in a matter of weeks, it, what many people across this country have known for a very long time. This is a political party that is now out of ideas, out of touch, lying, cheating, economically illiterate and morally bankrupt. And whilst people will focus on, and particularly Conservative Party MPs, will focus on what it means for the Prime Minister's job or what it means for their individual jobs, right across the country, people are worried about their own jobs. Right now in our country, and we should think about this for a moment, right now in our country, there are families knocking back items at food banks because they can't afford to cook them. There are, there are parents, predominantly mums, who are knocking back meals, passing meals, in order to feed their children. There are families worried about losing their home because their mortgages are going up even more than any kind of money they might be getting from the energy saving package that Douglas Ross is talking about. It is completely unforgivable. And I hope when people get to that ballot box at that next general election, they will vote for a meaningful change across this country to get decency back into our politics, to get compassion back into our politics, to get values back into our politics, and have people making decisions about what's right for the people, not what's right for individual politicians and their flawed ideology. Stuart. Thank you. But I agree with what Anas was saying there. I, I, I think it's extraordinary we've got this far. Uh, it feels like we're in a bad dream. We finally woke up. The rest of the country have finally woke up. I don't know what it's taken the rest of them, but it feels like we've known this all along. And when you say known this, known what exactly? That the Conservatives don't care about people. I feel like we're living on a different planet. <laughs> they don't, they're, they're absolutely, they're tone deaf to the needs of ordinary people. I can't believe even when they came back recently, they started talking about the discredited trickle-down theory. What an insult that we, as people, should be expected to eat the crumbs of a rich person's table. We deserve to be at that table. Man there in the blue top. I think Richie Sunak must just be sitting laughing his socks off saying, I told you so, because he said what would happen in a lot of the debates, in the leadership debates, and he was the Chancellor. And is he someone who would have had your support? Absolutely. And so, as someone who supports the Conservatives, then, what do you feel about what's happening now? <sighs> it's terrible, actually, to be honest. Um, but they, they elected Liz Truss, she's made that decision, and people are going to suffer for it. You had the Chancellor, he said what would happen if you did X, Y and Z, but they've done X, Y and Z. That's exactly what's happened. He must be sitting at home just laughing his socks off. Of course, we haven't heard anything from Rishi Sunak as yet. I mean, uh, Douglas, what do you think when you hear that? I mean, that's from a Conservative voter. Yeah, look, 
One, no one's laughing their socks off at this. This is uh, the biggest challenge we faced. Well, the in, bankers in, are actually. Well, sorry, Anna. Anna, if the I bankers can just. Are laughing all the way to the bank. Anna, if I could. This. Anna, this is a serious thing. I just, I, I want to address the point because people are struggling. They're struggling here in Musselburgh. They're struggling in my constituency up in Murray. They're struggling across Scotland and the UK. Uh, and that's why I've said, you know, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have to get a grip on this. There have been mistakes. They've got to work this out to settle the markets, uh, to settle the economy uh, and to get things back up and running again. But no one is, is treating this trivially. This is the most serious thing facing our country right now uh, and we've got to respond and deal with it right now. And that's what I think is an absolute priority uh, for the government, for all politicians uh, and governments in Scotland and across the UK. Person at the, yes, person at the back there with the white T-shirt. Douglas, do you think Liz Truss will win the next general election? Yes. Uh, look, uh, I, I want the Conservatives to win every You're election. That with quite a smile well, no, because well, I, can't, I, can't, I, I, I can just can't imagine what it. I can just imagine what you'd say, Fiona, if I said no there. But I want the Conservatives to win every uh, election, uh, and I always but, but go the, question, the election. But the question is, do you think Liz Truss will win? The well, next it was. Do I want Liz Truss to win the next election? And I do. I want the leader no, said, of the Conservative think, Party said, to sorry, win. I said, do you think she? Sorry, will I think you said do you win. want to. No, do you well, think she will win? Look, we're a long way out from the next election. The opinion polls just now are very difficult for the party. So yes or no? For me. The opinion polls. Yes or no? yeah, yes and or I said no? yes. I did say yes do you right think at the win? top. Yes, I do. Wow. Because I think we can get the economy back up and running again. I think we can help people. Clearly, Annis thinks Keir Starmer can win the next election. Clearly, John Swinney thinks if the Supreme Court doesn't go his way, then the SNP can win a de facto referendum. That's what every party wants their party to win. But at the moment, to me, that's a secondary issue. The big issue right now is helping people, people mm. in this room, people across the country, businesses and communities that are struggling. You've got wonderful optimism. We should be, we should be <laughs> on that decision, I think. Okay, okay. I knew there was going to referee <laughs> reference we were going to come somewhere. That we're going to move on because there's another very big question that a lot of you have asked about. You know, we choose our questions based on, you know, what you want to talk about. Before we do, I just want to say that next week, Question Time will be in Cheltenham. And the week after that, we're in Dulwich in South London. So if you live anywhere near either of those two places, you'd like to come along, do uh, go to the Question Time website and you can fill in the form there and be part of the audience. And actually on that uh, website, you'll see all the different places we're going to be. So you can make a note and come along to run the programmes in your area. But next week, Cheltenham, the week after that, Dulwich in, in South London. Right, let's come to our next question now, which is from Charlotte, Charlotte Devlin. Are unionist politicians afraid of a second independence referendum? Right. Well, it wasn't going to be long before we came to this question. Um, well, let's start with the unionist politicians then. John, obviously I'm going to come to you on this issue, but let's start with them. Annas, are you afraid of a second independence referendum? Uh, look, ultimately it's for Scotland to decide its own future, but the key challenge you have, and this is why I've said right at the outset when <laughs> the First Minister announced that they would be referring this matter to the Supreme Court, it, that I think it's right to establish the legal basis of any referendum. I think that's the right thing to do, the responsible thing to do, but you can't ignore the timing of any referendum uh, as well. And right now, less than a third of people want a referendum uh, next year. Uh, not, uh, there's not a majority in this country that supports independence. But I do believe there is a majority against the status quo. I do believe there is a majority against this uh, Tory government. And our job, the Labour Party's job, is to be the voice of that majority for change and to boot this rotten Tory government out of the next general election and demonstrate to people that there is a way that we can strengthen Scotland in a modernising, refreshed, and strengthened United Kingdom as well. That's the case we've got to make in between the run-up now and the next general election. Douglas? So, Anna thinks he can appease the nationalists by giving them more powers. I'd love John and his government to use the powers that they have to the best of their ability, but they don't at the moment. To, to, but to respond to the point, uh, we did have a referendum. We asked the Scottish people if they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom or be separated from the rest of the UK, and the people of Scotland said decisively they wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom. And what that referendum did, John and others will say that was a, a great opportunity and it was Civic Scotland coming together to have an open debate. We've seen during that referendum in 2014 and every single day since, uh, our politics has been dominated by the Constitution rather than dominated by the things that really matter to people improving our education system, getting our A&E waiting lists uh, and waiting times down, investing in the economy, dealing with the backlogs in the justice system. All these things are currently in the power of the Scottish Government and they could act on them right now, but they are distracted by trying to divide the country all over again, and I never want to see that in Scotland. John. I think um, Anna, Anna said something really very important and that was that Scotland should decide our own future. 
And I agree wholeheartedly with that. And at the Scottish Parliament elections in May of 2021, uh, the SNP was returned on a manifesto commitment to have a referendum on independence. Uh, there is a parliamentary, we had the largest vote of any party in the history of devolution in that election, with a larger share of the vote, more MSPs than we had in the previous parliamentary term. And there is a parliamentary majority in favour of legislating for a referendum on independence. So I think the people of Scotland should decide their own future. There is a parliamentary majority for a referendum, and I think we should have that referendum to enable the people of Scotland, particularly in the light of the turmoil that is being inflicted upon us by the mismanagement of Westminster at the present moment to decide our own future and be independent. But John, just to, just, just to clarify on that point, John, you, you will recall in the... Let's not forget, forget the context of that election last year. You will recall the final TV debate just days before the Scottish Parliament election. We were still in the midst of COVID and Nicola Sturgeon was asked directly by Glenn Campbell that if you wanted Nicola Sturgeon to uh, steer us through the pandemic, you didn't support independence, and you didn't support a referendum during the recovery, what should you do? And her exact words were, they should vote for me safe in the knowledge that getting through COVID and the COVID recovery would be my priority. So what she is doing is she is using the thank you she was given for steering us through the pandemic and the promise she made about focusing on the recovery and instead going back to the pre-pandemic Nicola Sturgeon that wants to pit Scott against Scott again. That is not right, no. that is not fair, and that is not people's no. priorities right now. Well, we've come straight through COVID, the recovery didn't even start yet, and we've been plunged into an economic crisis where people are risking their jobs, their home and their livelihoods, and you want us to open up all that debate again. That's not fair on the people of Scotland. Well, see, I think It's a wee bit of a selective recollection of the it's 2021 not, election campaign, Anas, because uh, both yourselves and the Conservatives, and especially the Conservatives, put out endless literature saying, vote for us to stop a referendum on independence. So, the, so regardless of what was in my manifesto, which was that there should be a referendum on independence, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party and the Liberals majored on the fact that people should be, their party should be supported to stop a referendum. Well, we won the election, and we won the election more comprehensive than we won the election in 2016. And we are steering the country through COVID, but anyone that looks at the turmoil that we've just discussed in that last question <coughs> about the crashing of the markets, tax cuts which are going to put, uh, to rectify these tax cuts, there will have to be colossal reductions in public expenditure, which will have a devastating impact on poverty okay. and equality right. in our society, and the way out of it is for Scotland to be independent. Okay. Now look, I just want to try something here. I mean, we select our audience very carefully to represent the electoral picture of the nation that we're in. We're in Scotland, so there are more people who voted for the SNP uh, in our audience than any other single party. And when it comes to independence, uh, it's, it's the audience is split roughly 50-50, which is, you know, follows the trend in, in polling. But there also there are people who are undecided. And we've got some of those in the audience as well. So can you all just put your hands down for a second? And I know that there are three people who told us they were there's more than that, but there, there are certainly three people who prepared to talk about it. So let's think. So yes, in the pink jumper there. Yes, um, I'm undecided at the moment. I think the timing's wrong. We have a war in Ukraine, and I think we should have a united front. Um, we also have a cost of living crisis that affects the whole of the UK. And I'm still unsure about the economic cost of independence. OK. And then uh, it's Gordon, isn't it, there in the, in the yeah. blue shirt? Yes. Yeah. I just would like to know what currency we're going to have if we're an independent country. It's the biggest sticking point I have. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have my hope. And there's Lucy somewhere. Ah, there you are. Yeah, let's hear what you've got to say. Uh, my, my partner works for a company that is a UK company. Um, and so I guess for us, it's the uncertainty if Scotland were to become independent, the, um, what will happen to his job? Will it remain in Scotland um, at the head office or will it then stay with the rest of um, the, other, the other nations? So, so that, that, more... that's making you unsure? Yeah, absolutely. I think personally, I'd probably be for independence, but then obviously you have to think about your livelihood. Um, the city over here has spoken about the cost of living crisis and all these other things that come into play. Um, you just really have to kind of weigh up, I guess, when the time comes. And, now, and in terms of what you've heard John say, for example, mm -hmm. does, that, does that sway you at all? 
Um, I would definitely say I'm more swayed by um, John's arguments than the ones on the other side, especially after the first question, question this evening, um, and just the turmoil in the state of the UK is just okay. really quite quite depressing. Okay. To be honest. And you've got you've got two other. Yes, go on. You want to say West, speaking in? Westminster's helping greatly with uh, the independence side of things. The fact is, there's not going to be a, any Tories at all in Scotland after the, the next election. Um, Labour, the stance on Brexit, they blew it with that. So, <laughs> but notwithstanding you're, that, you're still you're still undecided. Still undecided. And you're undecided as, as well. Finance for me. You, so you, it's it's, the, it's finance and yep. for you, what's the economy? John, just I need to get around everybody else as well. But do you want to? Just, what can you say, if, if anything, to persuade those people? Because at the moment they're not persuaded, even after having won nine elections. Well, well you see, the, the, the most important thing I can say is that I recognise the job of work I've got to do to try to persuade you. And that's the challenge that I've, I've got to address and that my party's got to address with the arguments. Well, Angela, what's if you look what at, currency are you going to be using? Well, well, well that would be, the, our proposal would be to use the pound and to move, For how to, long? Scottish, to, move to Scottish currency when the economic circumstances were correct. One of the arguments that I faced in the 2014 referendum, and I acknowledge this in my speech to the party conference at the weekend, people felt in 2014 there was more financial security being part of the United Kingdom. I don't think that's the case just now. I think people are well, very that's, much that's what unnerved, you're about, are yeah. very unnerved by the experience that there's been. Brexit has meant we've had Brexit forced upon us in Scotland. We didn't vote for it. We, we wanted to stay in the European <laughs> Union. And well, just wants to come back in. Yes, the oil prices completely dropped right after the last uh, independence referendum, and we would have been bankrupt as a country. No. Definitely, the oil prices <coughs> dropped completely. Dropped. Well, so well, where would the revenue well, have come well, from? Not, not, not everything hinges on that, because you've got various other levers at your disposal to improve the performance of the Scottish economy and to rebalance the economy. But my, my point is right. that nobody can look at the United Kingdom today and say with, you know, with any confidence, this is a financially secure country after the madness okay, then, of the right, last couple of weeks and the damage that's been done. How financially secure would Scotland be... Uh, without a central bank. I mean, that's one of the things that I think unnerves a lot of people who are wavering on independence, is that, you know, th th for all the turmoil in? that we've seen uh, as a result of the decisions made in Westminster, the Bank of England uh, has managed to uh, keep things much more stable than they would have been. And uh, just, uh, you know, it's, it's, I find it really fascinating that um, you talk about the turmoil in Westminster, and, you know, the, there's been a lot of that recently, but, Essentially, your proposal, not just in terms of currency, but in terms of independence, is to create more turmoil. So, I mean, you know, is it sort of better because it's SNP turmoil rather than Tory turmoil? No, John, I'm going to let you answer that, I promise. I'm just going to get my hand to it. So, I would just like to say at this point, I'm not, I'm not a big nationalist, but I think there's a, a fallacy. I hear it all the time, scaremongering that Scotland somehow couldn't make it as a country. A small country of six million people within Europe, we would do just fine. We're no daft. Our heads don't button up the back. Um, I, think, I think we'd be fine. We're sensible. We're known throughout the world for being sensible with money. I think we'd do fine. Over here in the red. Ross, John. Um, what happened to once in a generation, once in a lifetime? And I know this. I know the argument always comes to lots has lots has changed since then. But things were always going to change in a generation. I didn't want Brexit either. But things like that were always going to happen in once a generation, once in a lifetime. And I had my daughter was born then. She's still about this high at the last re referendum, and it's not that the lifetime ago. It's her lifetime ago, but she's this high. Okay, I'm going to go round, and then I'm going to get you give you a chance to answer all these points because there's so many hands. I just want to hear a bit more. Yes, the man in the grey waistcoat and the glasses. So the deputy first minister was saying that the 2021 Scottish election, um, the SNP did the best. The fact is that more people voted for union supporting um, parties and nationalist parties. So does that mean? that the de facto election only applies when the SNP get the vote they want it to be. OK. man here in the black jacket. <clears throat> so John was saying that the plan for, if we did get independence for the economy, it would be to use the pound. Yet surely one of the arguments for voting for independence is to enable Scotland to join the EU, but that's going to block it, is it not? Yeah. And the man in the, in the bright pink top, look at you there. Uh, one thing, I've never heard, due to a lack of transparency from the SNP, is 
surely there'd be a cost of setting up an independent country. How much would it cost to set up a newly independent Scotland? OK. And the, the man in the, the white shirt with the blue jacket right in the middle, there he is. I think, for me, surely there's room for a more nuanced discussion here. It's not kind of pitting brother against brother or a, a black and white yes, no. Is there a discussion around the federal setup, similar to the United States? Or are, are there any, are there any sort of compromise compromises, there. exactly, rather than it being a, a brother against brother, as I say? OK. John, there's a lot of points put to you there. I'm just going to remind you of something, because it's, it's unfair to expect you to remember them all. So is, Isabel was making the point, are you, is, would you create more turmoil upon existing turmoil? Um, once in a generation, uh, you were saying, again, talking about the economy, or, or, or maybe another way, as you're saying, sir, uh, some kind of compromise. I think in relation to the transition to Scotland becoming an independent country, remember what we're, we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve independence and be a member of the European Union, giving us economic opportunities and market opportunities that have been taken away from us, frankly, and made more difficult. And Scottish exporters and traders are facing that reality. So there are economic opportunities to be pursued. So the central issue about what's changed since 2016, or 2014, um, has been the EU um, exit, which has been forced upon us, and a very damaging set of arrangements put in place that are making it more difficult to, for Scotland to prosper. Indeed, much of the economic difficulty we're facing just now as a United Kingdom has its roots in Brexit and the folly of Brexit that's been imposed upon us. On the gentleman's question about a, a nuanced discussion uh, where it's, you know, there are other constitutional options, after the 2014 election, you know, I'd lost the election. I took part in good faith in the Smith Commission, which, looked, which was arranged after the referendum to give Scotland more powers. It was to essentially deliver on the commitments of the UK parties of essentially, as Gordon Brown said, the closest to federalism you can get. Well, it never materialised. So forgive me for being a bit sceptical about the United Kingdom's ability to reform itself when it's demonstrated over time that it can't do that. And currently, today, the devolved powers that, it, that Scotland voted for in a referendum are being systematically dismantled by a very hostile Conservative government in London. I think... That The original question was, uh, should uh, union, are unionist politicians scared of a second referendum? And my personal view is they should be. And you know, I live in Scotland, but I work in Westminster, which means I'm very tired most of the time from travelling. Uh, but from a Westminster perspective, I, I think there's a huge amount of complacency uh, in Downing Street, in um, the wider parties. I mean, the solution generally to the SNP surging, to support for independence surging, seems to be to have a new office in Downing Street with like three extra staffers who are going to save the union. And it's a bit pathetic. Um, I don't think there's enough anxiety down in Westminster, particularly um, within the, the government at the moment, about the prospect of, of a second independence referendum uh, going the wrong way as, as far as they're concerned. And I know there's obviously plenty of pro-independence voices there. I'm not entirely sure how many of them I've heard yet. And I can't tell which of you are. Someone shake their head, if they, or nod their head, rather, if they are. Oh, we know you're... Hang on. Where, where, there you are. So the woman there in the, in the sort of pinky beige top there, yes, with the dark hair. Um, so, coming back to the point about scaremongering and the last referendum, we were told that the only way to be sure of staying in the European Union was to vote against, um, the refer uh, against independence. We were also told that our pensions wouldn't be safe if we left the, the UK. And, you know, look at the situation we're in now. OK, and the woman here in the front, you're nodding your head all that in the... In the hang on, we'll just get a microphone to you, there we go. No, don't worry. I find it hugely condescending that this whole once-in-a-generation thing still comes up. So well, I mean, in fairness, this woman was making the point Yeah, the no, audience. I know, but so much has changed, and there will never be a perfect time for a referendum, but come on. If this isn't it, I really don't know when it is. And I find it incredible <laughs> that we can, we can constantly re-elect an SNP government, and yet Westminster turn around and say, there's no mandate for it. It's just hugely condescending and completely arrogant. You're just turning your back on the Scottish people and the Scottish nation. 
what is the democratic route to independence well, for Scotland? I, I just want to very quickly go back to John's big list of questions. And the one that he missed and maybe wants to answer now is, what currency would an independent Scotland have and for how long would we continue to use the pound? You're the Economy Secretary, you're the yeah. Deputy First Minister. So how long would an independent Scotland use the pound for? Well, I, I answered that question. No, you didn't, John. Well, 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 look, well, well tell us. Allow, allow me to, to, to repeat that again, <laughs> but I'll, I'll just say what I said the last time, which is that we would use the pound and then when the economic conditions and so tests were met, they would be... So well, what are well, those conditions? Well, the, 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 the conditions are all about economic stability, and about they are. the ability. Sorry. And they are. Well, the, the, well we've published. That. Well, if you want me to uh -huh. give you a, a, a page of a, yeah. a, a reading of the Growth Commission report, I can do it. Back I don't particularly well, want you to I'm do just, that. If I'm, I'm honest, I'm not thinking reasonably briefly. I know that one does need to do this. You can do it. You can do it. But I think the point. Sorry, John. But the key point for me is the point the lady in the front here made. Okay, well, a let's, democratic argument well, let's let Douglas answer that then, because it's so a question about unionist politics. So what you're saying Never. is you feel patronised. I feel patronised and I find it hugely condescending that, that, that you know, Woods Trust can turn around and say, ignore Nicola Sturgeon. How dare she? She's an elected politician. This I, woman hasn't even been elected by anyone. We are, we are a people. We are a country. And how dare you just say no I mean, without I even engaging in a conversation with us? Well, we are engaging in this conversation, and sadly it's... You're saying it's, no. Well, That's what you're I saying. don't believe in independence. I will never support separating so Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. Is there a democratic route to But on a democratic route, that's put forward by nationalists. People who want to separate the country <sighs> put that forward. You wouldn't expect a unionist to explain how we could uh, divide Brexit, from the rest of the Brexit UK. Brexit was all about, you know, returning sovereignty and getting your borders back and all the rest of it. I don't particularly think that the rhetoric that that happened in 2014 was as divisive as the 2016 well, Brexit referendum. Yeah. But if you want to follow that argument through, ultimately that's what independence is. So what you stood for as a Tory for Brexit is exactly what we want in Scotland. We want to be sovereign and make our own mistakes but, and make our own way forward. But we've had that debate. We've had that, no. we've had that debate. We've had that discussion. John also mentioned okay. uh, about the Smith Commission so move on yeah, yeah, delivering more powers, except John's government handed them back to Westminster. Powers over Social okay. Security okay. were devolved to Holyrood. Well, no, His government right. couldn't well. enact them, so they handed them back well, to well, Westminster. Well. So let's use the powers we've got to improve any waiting times, to improve okay. you, you, education, you've, you've to do all these things we list. could do right now, okay. rather than seeking more powers and to divide the country all over again. Now, we could also spend the whole programme talking about this. I'm not going to, though, because there were other questions that quite a lot of you asked about this next uh, issue. So I just want to come to Catherine... Uh, no, so Jamie Lister, sorry. Because there are a lot of people raised this, and I'd like to hear what you have to say. Was it right for someone in Nicola Sturgeon's position to incite more hatred in an already vastly divided society by saying she detests the Tories? Um, I, I'm thinking I can guess what you think, Jamie, from that, but let's hear your view. Uh, yeah, I think it was quite reckless, actually. She's meant to be the First Minister of Scotland, representing the whole of Scotland, no matter what political par party you vote for, uh, to come out with something like that. I just think it was, was, was quite, quite terrible. So, just to repeat, she said, I detest the Tories and everything they stand for. John, was she, was she right to say that? Well, I think uh, when you take the, the whole quote, what the First Minister was talking about, as she set out on Sunday, that was that she uh, detested Conservative policies. No, no, she, she, she said, she That's didn't say I detest the Tory policy. She said, well, well, listen, I'm only quoting, which is all I, I, I can go on. I did listen to that interview. I, I detest the Tories. And everything they stand for. She yeah, and I detest Tory policy. And, and I think, well, I think that's, I think that's the inference of what she was saying. And she went on to make that point clear. Is that the her, inference you took, her, Jamie? But, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm expressing to you what the First Minister explained later on the day about what was in her head when she said those things. Now, I think we've got to be. I think we've all got Would to be. Would you have said it? Um, I probably wouldn't have chosen those words because, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, maybe not quite as direct as the First Minister in what I see. I kind of go well, do you the think she was right way. to say it? Let me put it that well, way. Well, the First Minister speaks very clearly and very openly with people, and I think she's, been, she's set out exactly what she's concerned about. She's concerned about some of the rhetoric we got from the Conservative conference last week about rejoicing in the deportation of people to Rwanda. She's talking about... Um, you know, the, the, you're basically the, saying that, you know, other people are rude too, so she can be rude. Other people are no, mean too, so no, she can no, be rude. No, like. not at all. I'm, I'm not, that's, that's definitely not what I'm saying, Isabel. I'm saying the First Minister was talking about policies like the deportation of people John, to Rwanda or some of the benefit cuts that we've seen and the ignorance of the suffering of people in our society because of poverty and inequality as a direct result of Conservative 
policy. So that's the point the First Minister was trying but to get across hasn't. and to set out the fact that there are okay. clear differences a... between us and other political parties and we should be open she about those differences of opinion have... that, we, that we have. She and you have a responsibility, all politicians have a responsibility to help lead debates and to help move our, some of our most toxic debates, not just on independence, but on so many issues, to, to help lead those debates in a way that helps everyone, that, that doesn't entrench division. And so often on so many different issues, I see politicians either running away from a debate saying it's too toxic, I don't want to talk about that, people will get cross, you're a politician, I mean it is literally your job to do that for God's sake, yeah. um, or entrenching divisions further and then wringing their hands about the amount of abuse there is in politics and why, you know, with honourable exceptions such as the First Minister, women don't want to go into politics because they get much worse abuse than men. Um, let, let's come around to Cameron Russell Pound, Stuart. Yeah, I think it's a rare slip up. I think it was a slip up though. We, we, obviously we shouldn't detest anybody, especially if you're in the, the business of looking after people. But uh, I kind of feel that everybody makes a mistake and maybe we should move on. But Can I, can I just come there and make a personal confession? In, in the first TV debate in the 2014 referendum, um, I, I threw away a, a flippant line where I said, let's agree in the outset that we all love Scotland and we all hate the Tories. And I got a rapturous applause from that audience uh, at that first debate. But actually, in hindsight, I regret using that language because if you've seen all the things that have happened in social media, if you look at all the tragedies we've had where people have been entrenched into us versus them camps and lots of things, rising prejudice, rising hate in our society, uh, I don't think that kind of language uh, is right. We, we shouldn't hate anyone. We can disagree, vociferally disagree, but we shouldn't hate. I also don't like the language of political enemies. We have political opponents, but we are not enemies. No one on this stage uh, is enemies. So no one the across the wider is, is enemies. Scum. No, I'm, just, I'm just coming to that. Do you think she's the, wrong the, to do that? The challenge you have, though, is, and I think this is where the differentiation is, I don't detest anyone uh, in politics. I don't detest anyone on the stage. I don't detest any political leader. But do I detest some of the things that are happening in this country? Yes, I do. Do I detest some of the policies and what's become of this country because of those policies? Yes, I do. Do I think Swella Braverman makes Priti Patel look like Mother Teresa when she talks <laughs> about putting people, dreaming of people being on planes and shipping them over to Rwanda? Do I think Liz Truss now makes okay, Boris Johnson look like Winston Andrew Churchill? Rain, yes, she does. The reality is, though, uh, and actually, uh, what Douglas misses, he, earlier no, on, I've not spoken yet. Alice, you said you were going to come to Angela Rayner, no, 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 and, and was she wrong about She that? was wrong, and she okay. apologised, and she was right All to right. apologise. Okay, well, let's but say... also, the final point I'll make on this is, it was a gift for Nicola Sturgeon to talk about the debate being for three days about detesting the Tories, because it stopped her having to talk about the 700,000 Scots on an NHS waiting list. It stopped her having to talk about the 20,000 young people waiting for a child and adolescent mental health appointment. Okay. It stopped her having to talk about the 20,000 businesses that have gone bust, okay. because Anna. the Tories are a gift to the SNP, and that's why we need to get rid of them. We'll be at the back in the blue and white. I personally find it very offensive that is continually said that um, we're speaking for Scotland. John Swinney's party is speaking for Scotland. You may represent us, but you certainly do not speak for each individual person here. And the, the rhetoric that is used to continually put down the Tories, I by no means am a fan of Liz Trust and all the mistakes Trust and all the mistakes that she's made currently. However, I still think it's better than the situation we find ourselves in in Scotland, where we have a leader that constantly uses negative terminology, constantly barrages that about, and we're, accept we're supposed to sit here and accept it because the majority of Scotland are supposedly SNP. Please stop speaking for the majority of us. You do not represent every one of us. The man here in the purple sweater. No, the man in the purple sweater. I don't believe that was a slip. This is a First Minister that has uh, called Willie Rennie a pathetic attention seeker who has told a journalist she operates on a higher uh, plane than him, who has used vitriolic comments against Ruth Davison wanting to go to the House of Lords, who has failed to censure MPs who have used comments such as, if your God exists, may you rot in hell, or supporters who have said you should be set on fire. On, no, I'm not. I think perhaps, John, you should be really? rebranding your party as a Sturgeon's nasty party. OK, I will come back to you, uh, John. Uh, the, the man in the green top. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon knew what she was saying. 
Uh, but the thing is, it causes a lot of grief. It was only a few weeks ago up at Perth in the Tory hustings. The nationalists were outside and, you know, giving abuse and things like that. BBC reporters. So I think you've just got to calm it down and agree what Isabel was saying there. You know, I think she was right in what she was saying. And the man at the very back with the blue shirt, you've got your hand up there. Hi, yeah, um, I, I, I would just like to say I um, think as well that, uh, you know, I'd, I can't say that Nicola Sturgeon uh, made a slip up at all. She's very careful about what she says. I think, sadly, she said it to distract from the shortcomings of her party and have us talking about a word that she used, um, detest, which is probably ill-advised at best rather than talking about, you know, the real meat of the matter. And what I'd like to ask John is, you know, if the um, Tories are so detestable, would he welcome a Labour government in Westminster? OK, let me... I just wanted... Does anyone here support what uh, Nicola Surgeon said? Yes, the man there in the check shirt. You've got your hand up there at the back. Let's get a microphone to you. Yes, you support what Nicola Surgeon said. Well, I just... I don't I detest a very particularly strong words. Um, but what I would like, I actually have a question that might be for you, Fiona, if that's oh possible. Oh, my goodness, right. Um, <laughs> if that incident had not happened... Um, if, if, sorry, the incident being the, what Nicholas Sturgeon had... The interview with the words. Yeah. Um, is it possible that the media down south, you know, that the national BBC, the newspapers, would have taken any notice at all of an SNP conference in Aberdeen. I have uh, a feeling... The SNP conference is, is, is uh, always part of the news every year. Having done the news for 22 years, I can faithfully say, uh, yes, we would have. We absolutely would have covered the SNP conference, no question. Um, Douglas. Yeah, look, I, I would have a lot more respect for John if he would just accept the words that were used by the First Minister. He, he's tried to move on to the second part of the sentence, and I can understand that, but the first part is very specific. It is, I detest the Tories. That's hundreds of thousands of people across Scotland. It's over 20,000 of your own constituents, John. Now, that is language that does incite hatred. And as we heard, the city you also represent in Perth, we had a hustings there where a young party member got egged, others were spat on. They had to run a gauntlet of hate to get in to hear a process within our party. Uh, and Nicola Sturgeon at that point uh, apologised to a BBC journalist who was abused, not the many, many Conservative members who were abused in Perth. And I just think we've, we're better than this. We have to be better than this, John. And I, I think accepting that not only would you say it differently and use different words, the First Minister should apologise and retract those words because it is coming up. It's a big issue in the audience here tonight. Uh, and I just think our politics should be more focused on the debate we have and the disagreements we can have. Uh, and look, I, I've been criticised by politicians in my own party. Yes, could I be see small, Jacob, be, well, yeah, yeah, quite a light, yeah, light yeah, and look, I can, to bring no, that up. Well, I thought you would because I saw it on your right paper, you, Fiona. So, no. But, you know, I can, I can accept that. And, you know, John and I will robustly you disagree. You must have been pretty mixed. Well, no, not, you say, I can accept it. I can't believe you. You sat and thought, no. yeah. Uh, well, I, I do, right, I do because, because that is part of political debate, and John and I have had these debates in, in Holyrood before, but when it goes on a wider level, you know, I come into okay. politics, John come into well, politics, we John know the impact it has, but the okay. impact it has on young people, young members who are egged walking into yeah. an event okay. in your city, You've made John. that point. John, and, uh, well, I briefly want to give you a chance to answer for well, me. Uh, on, on the, the points about uh, the events in Perth around the Tory conference, says, I'm glad Douglas has raised this. I, I absolutely deprecate the behaviour that went on outside the Perth Concert Hall. That's in my constituency. I was mortified by it, Douglas, to be honest. There's a banner was put up there, which I'm not prepared to repeat here, which I totally and utterly and unreservedly disapprove of. Now, these are not my party supporters that were there. They're folk. Well, they fr are. Fr fringe. Well, uh, Some good, of them were. I had a good look at the television pictures, Douglas, to see... You know that, every uh, member of your party? I don't know every member, member but I, I, I was kind of having a... It's my constituency, Douglas. I was very concerned about it. And uh, the banner is from an organisation that is a very, 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 very fringe movement uh, uh, organisation that I don't approve of. So I, I hope for the gentleman up there who raised the issues, what I've said helps to address the fact that I, I, I deprecate that kind of behaviour because we live in a democracy, we've got to have our say, which is why I think we've got to have an open, civilised debate about the future of our country, okay. which is why we should have a democratic okay. referendum on independence, because we've got to have a democratic route to address the issues that face our country. Let's take another question now from Catherine. Catherine Murray. Pardon, sir. Health 
from social care services deserving of more than a clap and a pat on the back and empty promises. So, Catherine, what's, what's prompting you particularly to ask this question? I've worked for the NHS for 38 years. I'm just retired, but I'm also a service user. And I think it's a system that's under great stress, understaffed, under-resourced, and with pressure piling on. OK, and it's worth mentioning, of course, that, that the NHS and social care is an evolved issue, so that's something that's dealt with by the Scottish Government here. Stuart, I, I know you are also a user of the... the yes, uh -huh. I, I completely ag agree with you. I spoke to my GP the other day. He said, we're just trying to do too much with too little. I spoke to my brother-in-law, who's the director of HR at Nine Walls in Dundee. He said exactly the same thing. We're trying to do too much with too little. In fact, he said the staff are currently knocking their pans in trying to, to work through. He also said an interesting thing. He said NHS Scotland are the luckiest employer in the world because you have these people turning up engaged and motivated and some of them just working for not that much money. And uh, so I agree, the, the clapping, we all clapped for them. It's insulting what, the way that we're treating them now. Isabel? I've just finished writing a uh, book on the history of the NHS, actually available next year in bookshops. <laughs> um, <laughs> and a bookshop near you. Okay. One of the things that's really struck me about the 75 years of um, uh, the NHS you know, throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout Great Britain is one of the reasons we love it, I think, is the way in which it is held together with the goodwill of its staff um, who go above and beyond uh, what they're contracted to do on a regular basis. But that has never been more the case than at the moment where you just have exhausted staff from the pandemic, traumatised staff from the pandemic, who are still turning up, but who frankly would like to retire early or in some cases are actually being forced to retire early uh, because of issues with their pensions. And it, when somebody from a centre-right publication says we need to talk about the model of the NHS, people start going, oh my God, America, that's not what I'm going to say. But I think we do need to have a, a discussion about the fact that our health service runs hot every winter and now ran hot this summer, even before the temperatures started to drop. And a discussion about the and fact that... When you say ran hot, what you mean is it was under intense pressure? Uh, you know, near to 100% capacity, uh, under pressure with, you know, huge vacancies, particularly in areas such as nursing and midwifery. Um, and, you know, that's the case in England, that's the case in Scotland. And one of the reasons for that is the, the sort of loading of attention and funding onto acute care rather than primary care and community care. And that's, again, been the case ever since the inception of the health service. But it means that we don't have very much preventative work in this country. It means that people are coming to hospital with conditions that could have been treated much earlier. It means also, actually, frankly, that, you know, we barely have an NHS for mental health problems. I mean, I, I had a mental breakdown six years ago and I was at the Conservative Party conference, but that was unrelated. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, the, the sort of... Um, um, all the treatment I got, bar the GP, who was great with me, I had to go private for and, and that was okay because at the time I had savings most people don't have that and I think the NHS was founded uh, by partly by Nye Bevan who wrote a book called In Place of Fear I don't think the NHS has ever existed in place of fear for mental health and I fear that that is now extending across to physical health as well um, and I think the NHS is in its most precarious position it has been in its entire history at the moment. Anas. I, I actually worked in the I worked in the NHS as a as a dentist, and I know speaking to my uh, former colleagues just how broken um, they are. We're in the unprecedented situation now, where we actually have nurses balloting for strike action, uh, and I think we should reflect on how serious that is. That's not because nurses want to strike. It's not because unions want to strike. It's not because people want to see strikes. None of them want to strike, but it's because they don't feel they're being listened to and they don't feel they're being supported. And this predates the pandemic. All of these stresses, all of these strains were all there going into the pandemic and were exacerbated by it. We have record vacancies in our NHS, over 7,000 vacancies in the NHS. One in 10 positions in Scotland's NHS are currently unfilled. That puts a massive burden on the rest of the National Health Service. We've got record long waits, our a &E. That puts a massive pressure, yes, on the a &E services, but it also puts a massive pressure then on GP services and other acute pressures in the NHS as well. We've got one in seven 
of our fellow citizens waiting on an NHS appointment across our country. That is unsustainable, it is unforgivable, and the answer to it is partly more resources, of course, but it's also a credible workforce plan that gives the staff the support they need. Because quite frankly, right now, NHS staff are undervalued, under-resourced, and underpaid, and we have got to support them and fulfil that promise we made to get the when we said we, well. when we applauded those people on a okay. Thursday night to clap for our NHS, we promised that we'd reward okay. them after the pandemic. We now need to fulfil that promise. I want, we've only got a few minutes. So I want to try and get one more question. So it's a huge topic, I know, but if you'd be reasonably brief, John. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I want to acknowledge the, the, the point that Catherine makes about the, the, the enormous pressure the National Health Service is under just now, uh, and, uh, and to thank her for her contribution to the health service. You know, th this is enormous pressure against a backdrop of us having a record number of staff in the National Health Service and the National Health Service uh, occupying a greater proportion of our budget than when we came to office 15 years ago. But having said all of that, it is under enormous pressure, which is about changes in demography, about increased demand within our society. Now, part of the difficulty that we are wrestling with is the vacancy level just now. And that comes at a time where we've got historically low unemployment in our society. And part of this is explained by the fact that we've lost the growth in our population that took place in our working age population, which has been a big problem for Scotland for many years because of Brexit and the loss of free movement of individuals. That's lost a lot of people out of social care, so our delayed discharges are now over 1,700. Extraordinary high levels, and that's, forgive my terminology, kind of clogging up our hospitals. And that's because we don't have enough social care staff, because we don't have enough working age population because of the loss okay. of population due to I, Brexit. I need to let Douglas so, um, come in as well. That, that's Sorry, John. Sorry, John, to interrupt, just because we're running out of time to give him. So, at the SNP conference uh, up in Aberdeen uh, this week, at the start of the week, uh, the NHS uh, were criticised by the SNP Health Secretary, who told nurses to stop patronising them. These nurses were asking for a better deal. They were explaining to Hamza Youssef how difficult their job is just now, and they're not being helped by this government, because we see week after week, when we think any waiting times have hit their worst ever level, we just have to wait seven days because the next week's figures are even worse. Cancer waiting times are at their highest ever level. We've got problems in GP surgeries. We've got problems in our hospitals. We've got problems throughout our communities. Uh, and an issue that Catherine also mentioned was social care. You know, we focus a lot rightly on the NHS, but we're not doing enough to help the social care sector. And John's response is to centralise that whole uh, issue. Uh, and I think the plans to centralise social care are damaging. They're going to take away that local element that is so important to people. And even the overarching body for our councils, COSLA, led by an SNP councillor, have raised serious concerns. So I hope John will go away and look at that. That's not the type of reform that's going to help people. We actually just need to be investing more in our NHS, get these waiting times down and ensure people can get the care they need it in their local community. Catherine, you asked the question. I'm just wondering what you think of the responses you've heard, whether you're persuaded by any of them, encouraged by any of them, disheartened perhaps by them? I, I think we need to look at long-term planning. I don't think there's a quick fix. Right, and, and, and long-term planning in staffing, you're thinking particularly? Or? Staffing, training, organisation, everything. OK, we've got about 20 seconds. We've got, I've got time. So forgive me for not getting around more of you on this question. The woman there, yes, just too along from Catherine there, yes. I totally agree about the planning, but ha I'd like to ask John... I'm afraid John's not going to have time to answer, but, oh. but do make your point all the same. So, uh, the SNP have taken £53 million out of the budgets. I work in a GP practice, I'm a practice manager. And what you're saying, more money is just not true. And more people, the money you've taken away would have brought more support in GP practices. Right. That's not yeah. going to happen now. Well, OK, John, oh, I'm... I'm if you can answer that in five seconds, I'll let you go. I'll well, let you give well, you a well, good go. The, the, the bare facts are that the health service gets a greater proportion of our budget than it had uh, it okay. got when we came to office, and there's a record okay. number of staff in the health service. Right. I, I know you want to have more conversation. Forgive me, because we are out of time. The question I was going to try and get in at the end was, was, as a young person who has an interest in becoming a politician, Oscar, this is going to be you wherever you're sitting, what advice would you give me? Oh, I'm fascinated to hear what you have to say Do about it. that. I'm so sorry I have to end it there. We have run out of time. So... 
Thank you very much to the panel for coming. Thank you to all of you for being here this evening here in Musselburgh. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get around more of you. I certainly try my best. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. Remember that we're, we are in Cheltenham next week and Dulwich in South London the week after. Do come and be part of the programme. For now, from Musselburgh, bye-bye.